For those on the call that don't know, Congressman Rogers is in his 10th term and proudly represents the third district of Alabama. He's a sixth generation East Alabamian, father of three and married to his wife, Beth, for over 35 years. He is currently the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Congressman also has very close ties to the industry and has always been a strong advocate since becoming a member of Congress. With that, Congressman, I'll turn the floor over to you. Glad to be with you all, and I appreciate all the support I've always gotten from your industry uh, throughout my career in legislature and in Congress. And, and I am uh, very familiar with your industry, having uh, been a part owner in a dealership for many years, uh, and just selling out almost six or seven years ago. Um, I'd like to tell you there was some good news about things in Congress right now, but I'd be lying to you. It's uh, pretty much tied down in gridlock. As you know, we've got a 50-50 Senate with the vice president breaking ties uh, in the House. The Democrats have control uh, by three vote margin. So it couldn't be any more razor thin in the House or Senate, both of which are controlled by the Democrats and it is right now. And uh, of course we have a Democrat in the, in the White House and with a, a new administration, there's always a, an ambitious agenda that they're trying to get past. And, and with these narrow margins, it's just been, it's been ugly. Uh, trying to, to, because they are so ambitious and, and so much pressure on the Democrat side is coming from the far left uh, to do things that are just far reaching. And it, you can't do stuff when you're far reaching when you've got narrow majorities. It's hard to do it when you've got super majorities uh, because any of y'all that's paid attention to the legislative process, it's like herding cats. There's nothing pretty about it. So that's one of the reasons why more hadn't uh, been accomplished uh, so far in this Congress uh, that combined with the ugliness of the last election and the country is very divided. Uh, I, that's obvious reasons, I won't go into that. I'm happy to take questions if you want me to on that. But uh, I just take, I give you that backdrop to let you know, I don't expect a whole lot to happen in this Congress. You know, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in this business for my 36th year at a local level, state legislature and Congress. And uh, uh, you just get a feel for, for what's possible and what's not. And uh, truth is there's not a lot uh, under this dynamic with so much pressure from the extremes and narrow margins to get a lot done. I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I don't think I am. Uh, so if you don't see something big happen between now and the August recess, don't look for big things to happen. They'll come back with something in, in the fall, but it's real hard to get big things done in the fall because people are starting to look over their shoulders, getting ready for their primaries, which people start qualifying at the first of the year. So uh, when you look at the two year cycle that Congress is always on, serious legislation happens in the first year. The second, year, the second year is always an election year and big things don't happen then. So uh, uh, I know there may be some questions about a uh, infrastructure bill I know that's what the president's trying to get now. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, he's getting a lot of pressure from the far left to do a lot of things on climate change and social spending on an infrastructure bill because there is bipartisan support for an infrastructure bill. Uh, but once you start putting things on there like climate change and daycare and stuff like that, uh, you, you, you lose the Republican vote. So, uh, and they don't have enough Democrats to get it done. So uh, I would manage my expectations if you think there's going to get an infrastructure bill passed. And I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Uh, with that, I'll hush up and take questions if you got them. You know, a lot of issues that our, our members are concerned about is, you know, recall legislation that could potentially be introduced in, into the infrastructure package on the Senate side. Uh, on the House side, we're not really hearing much interest, which is promising. Um, to your point also about environment and climate change and, you know, going fully EV, I know that's a big thing that's been a far left push for a while. That again also has concerns with our members just because going fully EV, the infrastructure uh, on highways and the industry just can't really, isn't there or the stock isn't there for, for EVs. And then, you know, the whole statements of corporate tax increases on those making $400,000, I think. You know, a majority of our members um, are S corps and LSTs that tie in. You know, are, are will be extremely affected by that increase. Um, and you know, there's been discussions of how, if it's going to be included, if not. But to your point, there's that whole, 
issue that you know he's getting so much pressure from the far left of having this large infrastructure package but and with this extreme deadline of the 4th of July that you just don't know where things happen do you see anything on the house side of you know negotiations going on through energy and commerce or uh, any of your your colleagues that are somewhat promising no and uh, and the truth is yeah, because of this dynamic we've got right now, you're not seeing the normal committee work that you would you would see where that kind of stuff would manifest itself. Uh, I don't know if your your uh, members are aware, but we're still having to wear masks on the floor and and go through a damn magnetometer to walk on the floor. It's crazy. But and but part of the reason why Pelosi is still doing that when the Senate hadn't been doing it forever. I mean, no. It, that's like a nursing home over there. And those people aren't having to wear a mask. Uh, so the reason why she's got us wearing them is because she wants to keep up this proxy voting stuff that she's got. You know, there's a large number of Democrat members hadn't been on, been on the House floor in over a year. They're just calling in their votes. And one of the main reasons she's, well, there's two reasons why she's doing that. One is she doesn't have to listen to them. They're back in California and Washington and wherever else. And uh, so she don't have to listen to them and their opinions. And uh, and the committees can't meet in person either, as long as this, this rule's in place. But the other reason is they only have a three vote margin. And as long as she's got proxy voting, if a member can't be president because they're going to a daughter's wedding or to a funeral or their wife's sick or husband's sick, they can call in their vote. So if she gets rid of the, the proxy voting, all of a sudden she's got to hope all her cats show up. And that's hard to do in a, in a you know, body as big as ours. Somebody's always got a funeral or a, sick relative or something happening so uh that's part of what's going on but even with that i don't see her being able to get her cats herded to pass some of the stuff you're talking about and anything that she can get the left to agree to the senate won't take up and they're not going to get rid of that 60 vote filibuster you know i can just tell you and chuck schumer is giving it lip service that he wants to go away i guarantee you He's hoping to goodness that Manchin doesn't ever come off that Kristen Cinema, because he's only saying that because he's worried about AOC running against him next year. He knows good and well he's going to be back in the minority before you know it. He wants to have that 60 vote weapon to give him power. Uh, so uh, I say all that to say, I, the, all the things you're worried about, I'm not worried about happening. You know, if, if, if I really thought they had the votes to implement those tax increases, I'd be worried. Uh, they don't have the stuff to do with this electronic ve uh, electric vehicle stuff either. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff they'd like to do. And if they had a, a 30 vote margin instead of a three vote margin in the house and, and a bigger margin in the Senate, they could get some of that stuff, but they just don't. I mean, it's just the fundamentals of legislating right now. There's razor thin majorities and a far left that's making it next to impossible for them to get something pragmatic done. And, you know, I'm not just throwing shade on the Democrats. We had the same problem a decade ago with the Freedom Caucus. You know, they were just as unreasonable as you could be. And it kept us from getting stuff done. And we lost the majority of it. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier um, how Speaker Pelosi is, you know, uh, still requiring masks on the floor. And to that point, there's a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the, the negotiations on large on large packages do get worked on in the back channels. And when you're still stuck calling in votes or doing everything via Zoom, there's there's always going to be some sort of disconnect. You know, a lot of the, like I said, a lot of those negotiations get done walking into the onto the floor or walking to their offices or in the elevators. And so well, they're getting done in the speaker's office. That's one of the reasons she likes this. And my point is that the committees aren't getting the work done that they normally would do. And she likes it that way. I mean, she's the one that's, that, that's writing the bills that make it to the floor instead of them going through the normal committee process. So, you know, anybody would like to have that kind of power as long as they can keep it. I'm just amazed that the members are still putting up with it. We're in the minority. We can't do anything about it. But those Democrat members, particularly those on the key important committees like Energy and Commerce, which is the one that you care about, if I was Frank Pallone, I'd be throwing fits right now because he's got a very powerful committee. He's got his hands tied behind his back. Right, and that kind of leads into my next question. What do you see as the 2022 outlook of things? Do you think the House and Senate will flip um, or you know, one or the other? I mean, what is your take? 
I'm certain the house is going to flip, and they all know it too. You know, I, I've seen four changes. This is going to be the fifth since I've been there, and, and every one of them, you can see them coming. This mm-hmm. is not brain surgery. Because they only have a three-vote margin, we would get the majority back just through redistricting because we control the majority of the states, and, and, and it's our states that have been growing. Uh, but it's not just that. I mean, the history of the, of the Congress shows that all except two occasions – the midterm election of a new president, the average number of seats he loses has been 28, the average. And that's how Trump lost the House in his first midterms. I mean, it's just what happens. New presidents come in with big agendas and it upsets people and they get mad and they take it out in the next election. You know, people don't like change. It's like I tell people in Baptist churches here in the South, if you try to change the hymnal, the color of the carpet, half the congregation wants to break off and start a new church. Uh, they don't like change. And, and that's the same thing with public policy. And that's why new presidents usually lose the House in their first midterm election. And so uh, we're going to get the House in the midterms. And, and it's going to, I bet we have a, a 25 or 30 vote margin uh, in that election. Now, the Senate, who knows? I mean, the landscape is good for us. The problem is we've got twice as many Republican senators up, up for election as Democrat senators. So uh, it could happen. But I tell you an interesting thing, Brett, be thinking about, and then all you, you members, you know, uh, Kristen Cinema from Arizona and Joe Manchin from West Virginia have been objecting to getting rid of the filibuster, the 60 vote rule. And, uh, and they're doing it because they're from Republican states, particularly Joe Manchin. Uh, I mean, he, he's in a 70% Trump state. Only reason he's elected is because he's been governor and he's been in office forever. Everybody there knows him and loves him personally. And they know he's not a flame and live. Uh, and Kristen Cinema got elected just because she proved, uh, sold herself as a pragmatic down the uh, middle moderate uh, in a Republican state. Well, those people, what they're doing now is just good politics back home. And the left is going nuts on them because they want them to vote to get rid of the, because it only takes 51 votes to get rid of the 60 vote rule. Most people don't know that. Mm-hmm. So they want them to vote to get rid of it so they can run all this socialist legislation through. And neither one of them would go along with it. Well, they're particularly going after Joe Manchin. And what they better be careful of, because they started getting personal with him now, they push him too far. All he's got to do is change parties. And he would be a hero in West Virginia. And all of a sudden, the Republicans would be in the majority instantly. And the Joe Biden agenda would be dead. So those left, those those socialists on the far left, you better be careful how how pointed they get in their attacks on him because he doesn't have to put up with that business. That's a great point. I don't have any other questions. I would love to open up to our members that are on the call. We just got a question from Pokey Brimer regarding the CFPB and with uh, the confirmation of Rohit. What do you see as the overarching next steps or future for CFPB? I know Rohit's going to be. I don't I don't know when his confirmation is going to be on the floor. Um, but you know, another thing, um, as you know, that's an issue is, is the CFPB and FTC. So I just wanted your take on the CFPB. Now you got to something that really is a problem, uh, because while I've been able to paint a pretty good picture for y'all legislatively, that is they can't do big stuff legislatively with these narrow margins. So, uh, you know, a, a government that can't hurt you legislatively is good because more often than not, when the government does something legislatively, it's not good. It's usually going to be something that you got to be worried about. And that's why I'm a Republican. I want less government and less, less legislation going on. Uh, but now what people don't realize how powerful administration is is what it can do regulatorily. And, and that's where when you get a bunch of socialists running the government, they can kill you. And this, there's no better example of that than CFPP. I mean, that, that, that's just a nightmare. You know, we did our best to try to dismantle that while Trump was in office and we didn't get it quite done, but uh, they can wreak habit on, havoc on you. And as long as he's the president and he and doesn't have a check on him in the, in the Congress, you need to be holding on to your bill foe and your rights because they're both in jeopardy. Right. And then you have, you know, there's been a bill that's been passed out of uh, the Financial Services Committee from, um, Congresswoman Waters, the debt collection and how to go about it. You know, some of our concerns from our members' perspective is when you start talking about uh, mortgage lending and whatnot, auto lending and financing kind of gets wrapped up into that. So, um, hope we've been hearing in the Senate that it's that any 
that particular bill has been dead, so that's promising as well. But again, to your point, um, you know, our members have issues with the CFPB and regular, regulatory without reason, right? They just kind of throw things at a wall and hopefully things stick, and that's concerning. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Between now and the next Congress, you better hold on. But now once we get back in a majority in the House, at least, uh, if the CFPB starts, you know, getting really outrageous, y'all just let us know and we have no problem dragging them up before the Financial Services Committee and and uh, making them uh, have to at least own some of the stuff they're doing. Hope we can shame them into not doing some of the stuff. But now anything with Maxine Waters' name on it comes out of the House, you ain't got to worry about passing the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Even a Democrat controlled Senate. <laughs> I'm not hearing much about financial crisis as opposed to the last time that the Democrats were in power. Well, that's because we're coming out of uh, this pandemic and, and you know, they, they uh, would like to pass another COVID relief bill, you know, because it's what, what you call an emergency bill with throw all kind of crap in there. It's got nothing to do with the emergency they don't have the juice to do it again. That last one was literally 90% of that COVID relief package had nothing to do with COVID. It was bailing out labor union pension funds and uh, climate change shenanigans and all kinds of wasteful spending. But they use that reconciliation once and it's really a once a year deal. Uh, they're trying to talk the parliamentarian into the Senate into letting them try a second but I don't think they're going to have success because it's really meant to only be a once in a year vehicle. Um, so, no, I'm, but now having talked about financial crisis, we're coming out of this pandemic. The economy is, is really just chomping at the bit to do well. The only thing holding it back is the fact we got a Democrat controlled government and, and it's got capital concern. But we all got to be worried about uh, this debt uh, that's going on, you know. Brett's too young to remember, but I was there during Jimmy Carter's term. And I remember those 21, 22, 23% mortgage interest rates. I remember that infl inflation. I remember uh, those gas lines for gas. It was only 90 cents a gallon. Uh, I mean, it was a scary time and you can see it. It could happen again. We could see that kind of inflation get out of control. Uh, and I'm worried, you know, about the auto industry in particular, you know, I just traded uh, my used truck for another used truck and man, the prices are through the roof right now and the new, new trucks, new cars, period. I mean, you can't hardly find them. I know that's been uh, putting pressure on, on the independent dealers too, because you can't, you can't find what you want, what you can, it's too expensive to, to get. Uh, but, you know, it's all part of this larger economic dy dynamic that we've got. And what I'm most worried about is the fact that we now owe about $28 trillion in debt. And uh, you know, that's bad enough. But once interest rates start get moving from dirt cheap to not dirt cheap, that, it, that pressure to service that debt is going to have real problems on our economy. And I don't know what we're going to do about it. I mean, we had to borrow most of the money we borrowed to survive the pandemic. And that's why the Republicans supported the first three COVID bills. But now this one this year, we didn't support because it was, again, only 10% of a debt with COVID. Um, but we, we're going to have to face that debt sooner or later. I don't know how we're going to work it out, but we're going to have to do something. I wasn't around for Jimmy Carter, but I have read my history books. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to be there then. It and, was I have, <laughs> and I have seen those photos. <laughs> from james santa steven we have what's your thoughts on the cfpb possible non-business friendly as they target businesses they really have no idea how they work are interest rates possibly going to go up absolutely i think the the cfpb is one of the worst things that ever come out of the, the, the federal government it is unrestrained nightmare and if there's a way they can kill business they'll do it but when it comes to anything, you know, that, that deals with the automotive, independent automobile dealers association industry, uh, I, I'm a solid vote for y'all. All I need is for Brett or for Pokey or Henry or somebody let me know what y'all's position is and I'm going to take your position. Next is going to be from Barry. Do you think the 1031 estate exchange will be taken away? If they could, they would, but I don't think they got the votes. 
what are your thoughts on getting people back to work? We are in dire need for workers everywhere that we look. That's right. Well, one of the best things that's happened is uh, as of January 1st, I mean, sorry, June 1st, I think we've got 27 states that have now said they are no longer taking or accepting the federal supplement to their unemployment benefits. And, and I was touring one of the industries in my district yesterday, a manufacturer, and they said they're already seeing the results. They've had 20 new hires because people no longer are making more money staying home than working. And uh, so I think you're going to see that start to change. Uh, what I would do is any of your of the states that have not taken that position to stop accepting uh, the federal supplement should start putting pressure on their state legislators and their governors to follow the lead of the majority of the states and stop it. Because we've been paying people long enough to stay home. And it's time to get back to work now. We've got plenty of vaccines. There's no reason not to go back to work if a job's available for you. And uh, so that's what I would say. I'm, I'm proud Alabama uh, just this month has, has stopped taking the supplement. I'm very disappointed that Biden administration just went apoplectic over this and started looking for ways to force the states to accept that supplement. And that's just not there. What that's not, that's not appropriate. You know, the states have got a right to do what they think is right for their states. The federal government needs to stay out of it. Uh, but they're wanting to pay people to stay home and stay on the government tip. And that's just a, it's not what ought to be. We need people getting back to work and getting this economy roaring again. Is there a chance a wall in the South will get finished? Not under the Biden administration. But it will get finished. I think it's going to be a key uh, issue in the next election. Uh, when you stop building a wall and you change your immigration policy where you tell people, come on, we're not going to do anything about it, they're going to come. And we've got thousands of people a day coming across the border. And I was listening to a, a, a news report yesterday. They're coming from 75 different countries right now. So this is not just South America and Central America and the Northern Triangle. They're coming from all over the world. They know that's the way to get in. And these are not just good, good people. And, and one of my frustrations is most of them, you know, they come across the border. They just want to get in here for economic reasons. So when they come across, they're waving their hand, wanting to do customs and border protection to catch them. So they'll process them and turn them loose. Well, all of our agents are having to, tie, having to take care of those folks and get them processed. And they're not able to watch the bad folks who are bringing drugs and guns and uh, sex trafficking and gangs through, terrorists are getting through. Uh, it's, a, it's an unacceptable, the, this administration is the cause of it. And I guarantee you, this is gonna come back to bite him in the butt in the next election. Thank you, Congressman. We have another other question. So with that, I appreciate you taking the time, Congressman. Happy to do it. Y'all have a good day. On behalf of Auction Access, NIADA, and Congressman Rogers, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.